سلام علیکم و رحمت الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم لا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلی العظیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله على سیدنا و نبینا بالقاسم المصطفى محمد و على آله الطیبین الطاهرین لا سیما بقیت الله في الارضین عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من اعوانه و انصاره الحمدلله بی استادید سم اسپیکس آف ریبلیشن ان این پرتیکولار یسترده بی سید دت دی ترم وحی ویچ از یوز این دی قرآن لیترالی مینز تو کنوی ای مسیج in a quick and somehow secret way. And in the Quran it has been used in three different categories. Sometimes it is used for a kind of guidance, a kind of uh, suggestion, which is through natural instincts. For example, a bee receives wahi. أوحى ربك إلى النحل أن اتخذي من الجبال بيوتا. This is not a prophetic revelation. This is not even inspiration in the sense that we use for human beings. It's natural instinct. The second meaning is that it is used for inspiration, and it can be for a person who is not a prophet. But still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires him or her to do something. Like, for example, Allah says that we have revealed to the mother of Musa, Allah Nabi Nawa Ali alayhi salam, to foster Musa and then put Musa in a you know, basket and in the river. So, this was not prophetic revelation because mother of Musa was not a prophet. It is not also a natural instinct that every mother knows that she, she should do this with the baby. It was an inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third meaning is prophetic revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses a person to be a prophet and then sends wah to him. And this is to give him some message so that he delivers that message to the people. So this is the meaning that we want to explore more. The third meaning, prophetic revelation. We said to be able to receive the prophetic revelation, you need to have certain qualities. It is not something like a formal appointment. Someone is just appointed. He can be a person like anyone else. Among five people, ten people, you appoint one person to be the leader or director or the head of the group. So he can be up to one minute before appointment equal to other people. But now we say, okay, we want one person, we have to choose someone, so we take this person or even sometimes the people who are least qualified may be appointed. But when it comes to the prophethood, it's not like this. Allah says, Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu rasalata. Allah knows where to put His message. What does it mean? This is a very important point. It means that it's a matter of reality. It's a matter of really being different. And this is why Allah says He knows. If it was arbitrary, you can appoint anyone, then what are you going to know? You don't need to know anything because you are going to do it arbitrarily. It is only when the appointment is based on the merits, then you can say that I know whom should I appoint. So Allah says, Allah means Allah knows who is qualified, who deserves to be appointed. Okay, 
we mentioned three major qualities. One is purity. We said it is not possible to be a normal person with all the shortcomings and sins. And then all of a sudden you receive revelation from God. You have to be a person who has lived all his life a life of piety and purity. And this has many reasons and in the science of Kalam, our theologians have discussed why a prophet should be infallible even before the time of the prophethood. And they mentioned several reasons, but for me the most important reason is that it's a matter of being able to receive the revelation. Even if people trust a person who was not masoom, which is very you know, suspicious, very dubious, and people, when they see that someone has been a sinful person, then it's very difficult for them to put all the trust in that person and be able to go through all difficulties and sacrifice their life for such a person that up to yesterday was a sinful person, now has repented. But even if we set the, uh, put this aside, my major concern is that even if we forget the people and if we suppose that this prophet is going to be a prophet on his own without any community, suppose, still I think the prophet needs to be very pure to receive the revelation from God, to receive manifestation of God is something which is very difficult and needs to be in compliance with that, to be compatible with that. Whom can you teach very difficult points in philosophy? You cannot just pick up someone on the street and say, I want to teach you all the most difficult points in philosophy. You have at least to find a person who has spent his life in learning philosophy. He has managed to benefit from all the teachings which are available. Now you say, okay, I want to teach you something that no human being has ever discovered. So, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to choose a person as a prophet and send him revelation and have his manifestation through his revelation to that person, that person must be very pious. Also, that person must be very intelligent very much understanding and second he must have great capacity yesterday I mentioned this verse from the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لو أنذلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله if we reveal this Quran to a mountain you would see that mountain would become very humble and would be made into pieces because even a mountain cannot cope with this weighty word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, we unfortunately don't understand the Qur'an. We, do, we have not received the Qur'an. Our encounter with the Qur'an is just with the literal aspect of the Qur'an. But the Prophet received the Qur'an completely, but he managed to remain together because he had great capacity. Now I want to add another verse to make this even clearer and that is about the Prophet Musa You know that the Prophet Musa was under pressure by some people to show them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people at that time it seems that they were very uh, much concerned about sensation and perception through their five senses. So much so that even when it comes to God, they wanted to have a God that they can touch and they can see. And therefore, as soon as they crossed the Nile, they saw some people who are worshipping idols. Then they said, O oh Musa, they have plenty of idols. At least give us one idol. So that we can touch, we can sit in front of that idol, we can see the idol. They wanted to be able to physically relate to the Lord. And 
This is why you see that then Samari managed to deceive them. And one of the things that they did, they wanted to see God the Almighty. The Prophet Musa prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, said, Rabbi Arani anzur ilayk. Perhaps, and of course, he knew the answer, but he wanted the answer to come from God himself, so that leaves no chance for anyone to dispute. So he said, oh Allah, please show yourself to me, so that I can look at you. Arani anzur ilayk. Show yourself to me, so that I can look at you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّكَ لَنْ تَرَانِي يَا مُوسَى O Musa, you will never see me. لَكِنْ انظُرْ إِلَى الْجَبَلْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't stop just here. This is one of the things that we learn from the Qur'an, that when you want to educate people, you cannot just say yes or no. You have to give them also explanation. Even in the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes to make it very clear, Allah gives the explanation in the form of a kind of action, a kind of play. For example, when angels were surprised why Allah makes Adam his khalifa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, there are certain things that I know you don't know. And then he made an arrangement that he taught Adam all the names and then asked the angels to inform about those names and they said we don't know, then asked Adam to tell them. So Allah arranged everything so that they will be fully convinced. He didn't say just yes or no. Even here, Allah didn't just say, Lan tarani ya Musa finished. Allah wanted to illustrate this. So what did Allah do? Allah said, La kenan zur ilal jabal. Look at this mount. فَإِنْ اسْتَقَرَّ مَكَانَهُ فَسَوْفَ تَرَانِ If this remains intact, then you can see me. فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّ رَبُّهُ لِلْجَبَلِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested to that jabal, to that mount. So, some manifestation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was projected to that mount. Ja'alahu dakka. Then that mount was broken into pieces. Wa kharra Musa sa'iqa. And Musa fell down and was screaming and shouting. So, the answer is now very clear. So, Musa realized that it is beyond... His capacity to see God the Almighty. Okay, so when it comes to Musa, his capacity is to receive Torah. So anything more than that would be beyond the capacity of Musa. And therefore, something... This is a very important point, please listen carefully. Something that made Musa fell down and shouting was the same thing that made the mountain into pieces. Okay? So this means that Musa has no capacity more than that. When it comes to the Quran, the Quran is similar in a strength to that manifestation. Because Allah says, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبلين رأيته خاشعا متصدعا. And Allah has sent this Quran to the Prophet and the Prophet didn't fall down and didn't shout. Although it was difficult for him. So it means that the Prophet had a greater capacity than Musa. And you remember the hadith that I quoted yesterday from Imam Askari alayhi salam, that Imam alayhi salam said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the exact word of Imam. Verily God, of course according to my translation, 
Verily, God found the heart of Muhammad the best and with the greatest capacity, so he chose him for prophethood. So this issue of capacity is very important. And you see the result of this capacity in many different areas. Not only just in the reception of the Quran, also in the manner of the Prophet. The Prophet was so patient, so kind, so merciful, so much forbearing the wrong actions that we talked in the course about understanding God's mercy. So, this is another quality. So, piety, great capacity, and to be very intelligent. So, every prophet who receives revelation is the most intelligent, the most understanding person of his time. And we also quoted hadith for this. The other issue that we discussed was that when a prophet receives revelation, it leaves no chance for confusion or ambiguity or illusion. It's so certain, so clear, that it is like seeing something. Even it is more than that. But unfortunately, for us people, we don't have anything more obvious and more certain than seeing something. You know, when we want to say something is very clear, it says, you know, I saw it myself. And you know that even in seeing, sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes there are problems, you know, you see sometimes something and it can be a mistake. It can be a pseudo reality. But for us, this is the most obvious type of understanding that we have. When it comes to revelation, revelation is even more obvious. There is no chance of making any mistake. And therefore, we have this in many verses of the Quran. When Allah talks about prophets receiving revelation, Allah uses the term ru'ya. But ru'ya of the heart. Vision of the heart, not vision of the eyes. Eyes may need glasses, but heart never needs glasses. Heart are always, the spiritual heart is always strong. And the vision of the heart is much stronger than the vision of the eyes. And also by your heart you can see the things which are not possible to be seen by your eyes. So Allah uses this term of vision. And we also had this hadith that when a prophet receives revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows tranquility. And confidence to that person. So that person would be completely sure about his mission. And then I mentioned a difference between a prophet and a person who receives meanings and ideas. Who is muhaddath. Who is spoken. And we said even with the people who are muhaddath. Like for example the Lady Mary. Or about the Lady Fatima, one of the titles of Lady Fatima is Al Muhaddatha. So they receive ideas from God without being in need of going to school. Directly they receive from God. And the hadith says that these people receive the realities but not being able to see that reality. But still they will be confident and they will be certain and sure about what they have been told. There is a beautiful poem in Mathnavi by Jalaluddin Rumi. And this poem is more beautiful if it is in Farsi. Because he uses words which are uh, very similar in spelling in Farsi, but they have different meanings. So he says, when we write Shir, we write shir in the same way, but sometimes shir means lion, sometimes means milk. Lion is something that can eat you, but milk is something that you eat. So, there is a beautiful poem. And even the couplets look the same. An yeki shirast an dar in yeki shirast an dar because body also has two meanings. Body sometimes means bowl, sometimes means a plain, a kind of like desert. So that is a shear 
in plain, that is shear in uh, bowl, which is one is lion, one is milk. آن یکی شیر از آدم میخورد این یکی شیر از آدم میخورد that is the milk that human beings eat this is the lion that eats human beings so then he says when we look at the prophets we think we are the same like shir and shir like milk and lion we think that we are the same because we are all human beings we all eat, drink, become ill become old but he says there is great difference between us and the prophets we shouldn't think that they are like us and their knowledge is like us or the way that they receive is like us you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ tell them I am a human being like you okay but إِنَّمَا يُوحَى إِلَيَّ قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ I am a human being like you, but you ha ilayya. I receive revelation. This is a big difference. We are the same in humanity, but he receives revelation and we receive nothing. So there's a big difference. We shouldn't think that the Prophet's knowledge is like our knowledge. The Prophet's understanding is like our understanding. <coughs> and then Rumi makes other examples. He says, there are some Bees that they go and, for example, eat around and they produce honey. But they are those that maybe they have the same food, but they are poisonous. They come and bite you and they make you, you know, trouble. Or, for example, there are some deer that they produce what we say, mushk. Or in Arabic, misk, which is a best perfume, or one of the best types of perfume. It comes from the blood of the animal, and it's produced, you know, on the top of the stomach, near the skin of the stomach. So it's coming from the same blood, but other types of deer, they have the same food, but instead of producing perfume, they produce, you know, think they just smell very bad. So, you shouldn't say that because these are human beings like us, they walk among us, they eat and drink like us, so they are exactly like us. Yes, they are human beings, but they are very different. Why? Because they have lived a very pious life and Allah has chosen them and even raised them further and sent His revelation to them. Of course, to guide us, to benefit us. But they are different from us. So, no one should think that revelation is a normal type of knowledge that you go and learn. Sometimes you are not sure whether you have understood properly or not. Sometimes you may forget. No, there is no chance of forgetting. Even sometimes the Prophet was uh, so much uh, passionate and concerned about the revelation that he was very, you know, maybe perhaps worried and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we will read the Quran to you recite the Quran to you you will never forget the Prophet never forgot any piece of the Quran never made mistake saying I don't remember this was the verse which was revealed to me or this was the verse you will never forget so this is a special type of knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon His Prophet. The Quran also tells us that although to receive revelation is a very special gift, but it has happened throughout the history of mankind. So no one should be surprised why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has received... The Quran. Because some people were saying, how is it possible that God speaks to a person? And unfortunately, even some of the people of the book, they were saying that how is it possible that God communicates to a human being? And the Quran says, so who spoke to Mo Moses? Who spoke to Abraham, to Yaqub, all these prophets? So, this is not happening to everyone, but has happened many times in the history. 
And the Quran doesn't mention how many, but according to some hadith, there were 124,000 prophets. So they all received the revelation. So it is not something that is very frequent, but it is not also that rare that then you say, no, it's not possible. It never has happened. It has had similar incidents. And altogether, Quran mentions 25 of the prophets and the Quran itself says that there are many that we have not mentioned by name. Chapter 40, verse 78. Allah says there are many that we haven't mentioned them by name. But 25 names uh, are mentioned for the prophets in the Quran. And according to the Quran, we have to respect, we have to honor all previous prophecies and revelations. You cannot be respectful to the Quran by rejecting the previous revelations. You cannot say, I am so much in love with the Quran that I want to reject anything else. No. The Quran is a confirmation of the previous prophecies. So if you respect the Quran, you have to accept all of them. So a requirement of Islamic faith is also to recognize previous prophets and prophecies. To, so much so that the Quran says that the believers are those who say La min We don't make any distinction, we don't discriminate against any of the prophets, we believe in all of them. We love all of them. We believe that all the prophets were infallible. Even those things that you find in some scripture, for example, in the Bible, you find about the prophets, about, even about the Hebrew prophets, that are not um, in compliance with their infallibility, we don't accept. They themselves accept. But we don't accept. The things that they say about, for example, David or about, for example, uh, Jacob and other things, we don't accept. So, we believe that all the prophets were infallible. We love all of them. But, of course, the Quran itself says that the prophets had different ranks. They were not all equal. The Quran is also clear that Allah has raised some of them over others. And among all the prophets, five prophets are very much singled out. And these are Ulul Azm, the people of great determination. Nuh, Nuh ala Nabiina wa Ali wa Salam, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa These five are the most outstanding prophets. And it is interesting that among all different qualities that they had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stresses on determination. These are the prophets who had determination. Because we human beings, more than anything else, we need determination. Because we know many things, but we are not that much determined to observe them. These prophets were so determined that they didn't lose any single opportunity to do something to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I sometimes say that when Allah says, these are ulul azm, for example, Allah says, Fasbir kama sabara ulul azm min al rusul, in a sense, Allah is teasing Adam. Why? Because when it comes to Adam, Allah says, Lam najid lahu azma. We didn't find determination in Adam. Because we told him not to go near this tree and still he went. So Allah says, Lam najid lahu azma. We didn't find determination in Adam. These are the people who have determination. And this is very important for us. May Allah inshallah give us such strong determination that we only do those things that we know they are right. So, these messages which were delivered by these prophets, including these five, they all are to be recognized as true, as guidance. But, 
when we go to the content, when we go to the details, we find that there are two aspects. One is the core message, one is the essence of the message, which is the same. All the prophets have come to invite people to unity, unity of God and unity of people, to prophethood, to believe in the hereafter, to believe that what you do you have to be accountable for, there would be eternal life for us. These are all shared by the prophets. But there are also some details, especially when it comes to the practical rulings. And these details can be different from one prophet to another prophet based on the condition of his time, of his age. At one time, there was a need to stress more on being, for example, a strong in being able to fight like the time of Musa, and at that time physical power and physical wealth was very important. When it comes to the Prophet Isa's time, to stress more on the spiritual side was important, to bring them to the balance. But when it comes to the seal of the Prophet, when it comes to the final eternal message, then it takes into account all the things that humanity need till end of the world. And then those details which can change from time to time, this message leaves it for the people themselves to decide based on the principles that this message gives them. There is a very beautiful hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and it is in need of lots of explanation. I don't have time to go into details, but inshallah you reflect yourself. If you have questions, we can talk about it later. Mu'allab ibn Khunais narrates from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, and this hadith is mentioned in Amali, in Kafi, in Mahasan, in many books. Ma min amrin, sorry, this is in Mahasan. Ma min amrin, يختلف فيه اثنان إلا وله أصل في كتاب الله عز وجل. There is no issue that two people disagree on, they debate, they dispute on, except that it has a principle in the Quran. There is something in the Quran about that issue. So, if there is a problem between husband and wife, between parents and children, between two neighbors, between two colleagues, between two countries, every problem has a relevant principle in the Quran. If you follow and observe that principle, first of all, you would not have problem. And now that you have problem, if you now go, you will be able to solve the problem. But what is the challenge? Is whether we can get it or not. وَلَكَنْ لَا تَبْلُغُهُ أُغُولُ But the problem is that human minds are not able to grasp this. Therefore, we are in need of teacher. We are in need of someone to teach us the Quran. The principle is there. You know, it's like, for example, you have a kind of disease. I take you to a big super drug, big pharmacy, I say, everything is here for your pain. But you don't know which one to take. You are in need of a guide, someone who prescribes for you. And this is why, right in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that we have revealed the Quran to you, so that you explain it for the people. لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزَّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ and after the Prophet, this is taken over by Imams. Imams are those who make sure that authentic presentation and interpretation of the Quran is offered. Not something based on human you know, knowledge, which is very much subject to mistakes and you know, illusions and confusion. Someone who has the same connection to 
divine knowledge, but he's no longer a prophet, he no longer receives a revelation, because the message has come, it's just in need of being interpreted, in need of being taught. We don't need any more revelation to come, but we need to make sure that this teaching and explanation is authentic. So we need that amount of assurance, that amount of sanction, to make sure that this is not going to misguide us. This person is not going to tell us something which is not in compliance with the message of the Quran. So, everything that two people may disagree or dispute has a principle about it in the Quran, but the minds and intellects of people may not be able to grasp. So, the core message of all the books, all the revelations are the same. There can be details which can be sometimes different from time to time. And this is why at every age, when it comes to the details, to the practical rulings, they had to refer to the most recent Sharia, the most recent code of law. And when it comes to our time, up to the end of the world, we have to observe the code of law which is brought by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. Halalu Muhammadan halalun ila yawm al qiyamah. Whatever is permitted in Islam, in Islamic Sharia, is halal till the day of judgment. No one can make it and should make it haram and vice versa. Of course, as I said, in Islamic Sharia, there is a mechanism which didn't exist in previous Sharia because they didn't need that, because they just need it for a short time. But in Islamic Sharia, there is a mechanism, and that is the Sharia itself doesn't involve itself with the details. And unfortunately, sometimes people don't get this right. They think that everything which was practiced at the time of early Islam has to be literally the same. And this doesn't make sense. For example, if at that time they had a special dish, Medinan dish or Meccan dish, we don't need to have the same dish. If they had a special way of dressing, we don't need to have the same. Yes, Islam says these are the halal food, this is haram food. How you want to cook it, how much salt, how much chili, how much oil, just observe halal first. Second, it must not be harmful to your health. Any food which is harmful to your health is not allowed. And third, it must be something that you own it. You cannot say, this is halal meat, so I rub it and eat it. The ingredient must be halal, the ownership must be yours, and it must not be harmful to your health. Observe these qualities, then in any way you like, you can cook it or eat it. Any time of the day, any place. Yes, we have also some uh, etiquettes, we have some adab, some suggestions that if you do it in this way, it can be better, but there is no restriction. You can do it as you wish. When it comes to dress, your dress must be a modest dress. You must not, for example, dress in the way which would be not in compliance with your honor and dignity. You must own your dress. For men, it must not be, for example, pure silk or silk according to the details. You observe these things, then you can make it in the way you like. The material can be what you like. There are certain details, some of them I mentioned, some of them you can learn yourself or you know already. So basically, the Islamic Sharia has liberated itself from undertaking all the details so that it can remain something that can be applied over ages and centuries. And this is the job of a qualified faqih, a qualified jurist, an ayatollah, to realize what is something which has to be always observed and what is something which is possible to change. There is a flexibility here, there is a vitality here in the fiqh of the school of Ahlul Bayt. So we never get stuck in any situation for which we don't know what to do. Okay. 
The other issue that I want to mention today, inshallah, is about different forms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicating to his prophets. In the Quran, in Surah Ashura, which is chapter 42, verse 51. So if you look at this verse, inshallah, now I read for you, but later you can reflect. Chapter 42, Surah Shura, number 51. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this verse is very important in all texts on Islamic theology, you find this. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يُكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهِ إِلَّا وَحْيًا أَوْ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ أَوْ يُرْسَلَ رَسُولًا فَيُوحِيَ بِإِذْنِهِ مَا يَشَاءٍ it's not possible for a person to be spoken by God except in one of these ways. So to be able to be spoken by God, one of these three ways must be available to you. One is wahyan. Revelation. What does wahyir mean? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly immediately puts the content of wah into the heart of the Prophet. There is no need for something to be between God and the Prophet. Okay? This is immediate. Aumin vara'i hijab Sometimes is from behind a veil. Like Musa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa through a tree or a bush. Kallamallahu Musa min shajaratin taklima. We have in Dua'i Nudba also this. Allah spoke to Musa, but how did he spoke to Musa? Did Musa receive the revelation directly? No. Was there an angel look like Gabriel? No. He heard a voice coming from a tree. Okay? So, it's menvara'i hijab. Means there was a veil. There was something between Musa and God. God spoke to Musa, but by creating voice, and Musa thought that this is the tree. But, of course, he realized that this is why. But it's a, not a tree unless it is permitted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O your seller rasulan. O Allah sends an apostle, an angel. And reveals to the servant of him what he wants. That angel reveals to the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what Allah wants, bi'idhni, means with the permission of Allah. So whatever Allah wants, whatever Allah allows, that angel communicates to that prophet. Innahu aliyun hakim. Truly Allah is the high and the wise. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the next verse, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِنْ أَمْرُنَا And in similar way, we, when it comes to the Prophet Muhammad, Allah says, We send to you a spirit from us. Before that, you didn't know what is the book. It's not your knowledge. It is Allah's knowledge. The Prophet didn't know the content of the Quran, the ideas of the Quran by himself. He was taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَكَنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا نَحْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا We have made this Qur'an a light by which we guide our servants. وَإِنَّكَ لَتَحْدِي إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْدَقِيمٍ And you guide the people to the right path. So it means that we have given you this light, which is Qur'an, to guide people to the right path. Okay. So there are three ways. I have done some... Research, as I said, and overall I have found these details for these three communications because each of them can have some detail also. So I want to share with you quickly different ways of each of these three. 
The first one, Wahyan, which is direct, immediate communication. As scholars say that this by itself can be one of the two types. Sometimes a suggestion is thrown by God into the heart of a prophet by which he understands the substance of the message. It can be a command, it can be a prohibition, it can be a statement. So Allah directly puts that message into that prophet's heart. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to a person without wail. This is also immediate. So if someone hears a voice, but not from a tree, he hears the voice directly, then this is also direct and immediate communication of God. So there is no angel in between, there is no wail in between. This is the first type. The second type is from behind a whale. Of course, this is something spiritual. It's not that that tree is speaking. It's something that is very special. And the prophet himself realizes that this is not the tree. But it looks to other people, it's the tree. This happened to Musa, Allah, Nabi, wa Ali, wa alayhi salam, in the Mount Sinai. And also, according to hadith, we can realize that sometimes, perhaps in the night of Mi'raj, when the Prophet ascended to heaven, also, sometimes he was receiving a voice from a whale. The third type is by sending a messenger. And you know that one of the tasks of Jibrail, Gabriel, was to bring down their revelation. But it was not that for every prophet Jibrail used to come. Sometimes the prophet didn't have the honor of receiving the revelation from Jibrail. So this by itself has different types. Sometimes the angel deposits the revelation in the spirit of the prophet without appearing to him. So he doesn't see the angel, he doesn't hear anything from the angel, the angel has brought the message to the heart of the Prophet. Inshallah, I am going to talk about Laylatul Qadr. And I will talk, inshallah, based on the Quran, that in the night of Qadr, the angels descend to the heart of the guardian of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Waliyullah. So don't be surprised when I say the angels come to the heart of someone. It's mentioned in the Quran. We will talk about it. So, the angel deposits some idea, some message into the heart of that person without the person seeing the angel. Sometimes the angel appears as a human being and delivers the message to the prophet. People may think that this is a human being, but the prophet knows that this is not a human being. For example, about the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, We have this that on occasions a very beautiful person visited the Prophet. Dehyeye Kalbi. And this was Jibrail. So Jibrail took the form of a human being and spoke to the Prophet. Also, in another context, of course, it was not prophetic revelation. But when Jibrail wanted to deliver the message of God to Mary, also at that time, Quran says, Tamathala laha basharan sawiyya. Jibrail took the form of a human being. Because angels can take a form. So they can take the form of a bird. They can take the form of, for example, a human being. So they can take different forms. So sometimes the angel appears. He can see the angel, but in the form of a person. Sometimes the angel calls in the ears of the prophet, like a bell. And this is very difficult. Because that sound is so powerful 
that it would be very difficult for the Prophet to cope with that. And sometimes, which maybe has happened only to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Gabriel appeared in the way that God created him. Not as a human being. As a human being is easier. In the way that God has created Gabriel. And you know that Gabriel has no physical body. So if you see Gabriel, you see that Gabriel has filled the whole world. You know, for us to explain it in just the way that we can. So to see the reality of Gabriel is something that a physical person or a person who is bound to the material life would not be able to do it. You must be yourself very spiritual to be able to see Gabriel in its real face. So, these are different ways that an angel can be between God and Allah uh, between God and the Prophet of Allah as a kind of medium that through him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the message. And inshallah we will continue this discussion tomorrow about other aspects of revelation and then I want to inshallah talk about uh, the revelation of the Quran in Laylatul Qadr, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.